it in here. <laughs> it feels a lot different. But we're going to make make a go of it. So, okay, let's go. We're live. I'm Michael McCullough at Willard Library, Mac McCullough. And uh, we are live streaming from Willard Library tonight, which is a little bit different. Um, but uh, we'll see how it goes. All, all things new sometimes. And my guest this evening is James J. Smith. James is an author, uh, uh, a speaker, a uh, uh, both a columnist and, and writes books. Um, and he's also a Navy vet. Um, I have here that he's written uh, also for Grand Rapids Times and the Enquirer. Uh, back when I was the editor, he was writing writing for the Enquirer. And, and James has a new book out. It's called Patriot to Trader. And it's about a, a young man, a young African-American man's uh, journey through the, uh, uh, the U.S. Navy. Um, Terry Anderson is his name. And confronting, uh, confronting racism as he sees it. And torn really between uh, loyalty to his country and his uh, uh, dream to follow in the footsteps of his father, also a Vietnam vet, and his grandfather. In fact, he had military lineage going all back through the Revolutionary War. And it's a fascinating read. We have it here at Willard Library, and you can buy it too. You can borrow it and buy it. What do you think <laughs> of that, James? <laughs> Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's, it's great to have you, and, and I'm really excited about this. And so, you know, one of the first questions I want to ask you, uh, you're a naval, naval veteran, a Vietnam era. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, what, how much of your experience and your life is reflected in, in the, the main character, Terry Anderson, in this book? Well, the main character, as you stated, is Terry Anderson. And as a young black man, he is conflicted about military service, even though he's raised and comes from a military family with a strong military background. But during the course of just being a young black man in America, he starts to wonder and question his loyalties. And myself, using myself as an example, during the Vietnam era, I was confronted with that inner turmoil, if you will, in terms of wanting uh, to do what was best for me and fighting in Vietnam for me was not the best thing for me to do because um, to quote Muhammad Ali, uh, Muhammad Ali said that no Viet Cong ever called him nigger. And that made a whole lot of sense to me because I couldn't understand or I couldn't see why should I go thousands of miles away to fight the yellow man for the white man when I as a black man still have to fight here at home just to get equal rights. And so I was conflicted with that. And so that gave me the impetus to write this book. It's a fictional novel, but the premise of it is very real, even though the characters are not real, but the premise of it is very real, especially being black and in America. Yeah, and you know it's 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 such a it's such a raw conflict for for this young man Terry Anderson. Um, it's a lifelong dream, and it's something that his father um, has encouraged, and his father is, is very proud of him. Mm -hmm. um, but he begins to just experience a lot of conflict um, in the time leading up to it, and right up into right up into flying, you know, flying, taking his flight, and and uh, and to where he is first stationed. Um, and you begin to see this tension even develop between him, even developing between his father and himself. Um, it's yeah. really, uh, you know, it's just very poignant. How, how much of that experience resonated with you as a young man and how much of, of your experience, I'm sorry, how did those experiences in the Navy form you? I mean, you, you must have been a very young man, 18, 19, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, my first real big experience about that was when I was in boot camp in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. And once I completed uh, boot camp, then uh, we had the opportunity to apply to a school. 
And at that time, I wanted data processing because I wanted something I could use after I got out the Navy to get a job. And there was one spot that was open and myself and another applicant were vying for that spot. Now it was myself and another young white recruit and he just had a high school education. Now I myself, I had a couple of years of college. So I felt that I was more qualified to obtain this position, but that wasn't the case. I didn't get the position. So that left a bitter taste in my mouth. And as far as I was concerned, I was passed over because I was black. That's that's how I view it. Now, there may have been some that would have disagreed with that. That could be, but that was my frame of thought. Mm -hmm. And another incident is when I was in Great Lakes and I got put in a, another school. The barracks I stayed in, I was the only black on my floor and those doors in the rooms didn't have any locks. And one day I went to class and I came back and there was a KKK sign on my door. And underneath it was a caption saying, we're here and we're waiting for you. So when are you gonna be here, nigger? So I said, okay. So I went to the local hardware store and I bought a hatchet and I slept with it underneath my pillow for the six weeks that I was there. And when I went into the shower, I didn't just walk in the shower, I backed into it so I could see my line of vision, see everybody so that nobody could sneak up on me. And that's the way I lived for about six six weeks like that every day. So how, how typical was that then? And well, um, the Navy at the time, they like to they say that it was the new Navy. Yeah. It may have been the new Navy, but it still said had still had the same old people with those same old antiquated ideas of what black should and should not do. Because at that time, it hadn't been long after the uh, riots had occurred on the, the USS Kitty Hawk, which is the aircraft carrier. And blacks had taken over that ship in protest to the conditions that they had to endure. And so the Navy had called itself doing a rehaul of how they were gonna treat black sailors, but the attitudes were still the same. So it was still, it was still a hard go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you, you raised, you raised uh, your, own, your own experience with uh, going for something that you were passed over for. And, that, and that's a, uh, a critical point in, in, this, in this novel as well, when, when Terry Anderson, who was in the Naval Academy, right. um, uh, near the top of his class or at the top of his class, I don't recall exactly which, and, and he was on an engineering track. Mm -hmm. But when it came time to be deployed, he was deployed to Pearl Harbor, which is nice. <laughs> but mm -hmm. he was de he was deployed in, in communications and, and and really felt the sting of that, and and, and felt the uh, you know the sense that it had something to do with the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as you know, and I, I I'm just how do you how do you reconcile that in the sense that that um, as you said, someone might not have agreed with the reasons behind your you, right? Uh, and so, how how do you how do you navigate that? Because you don't know for sure. Well, I'm I'm reminded of an example of uh, Michael Eric Dyson gave this example. He said that there were two fish swimming one way, and they ran into another fish who was swimming towards them. So the two fish going this way and the one fish coming this way, they met and, and paused. And the single fish said to the other two fish, he said, well, uh, how's the water today? And the other two fish look at one another and one says to the other, well, what's water? Yeah, yeah, I've heard that before too. Yeah, and, and the point being, when, when racism and privilege are so prevalent, they get to be commonplace to where you don't think about them as being a privilege. It's just 
a normal thing that just is. So you don't think of it. And when I say you don't think of it, I'm, I'm speaking about white people. They don't think about their privilege as being a privilege. It's just something that's normal. It just is. And so, and when you point it out, it's, they look at you with raised eyebrows, like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, because they don't, they don't get that because they've never had to. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the, the uh, most important lessons and sometimes the hardest thing to learn because a lot of people, especially if they're not necessarily wealthy or powerful mm -hmm. um, and, and they're told that they have privilege, it's hard for them to see that. But that what you just you just put your finger on it. Um, you know, they don't have to think about it, whereas you're thinking about it, you know, as a black man or a black individual or a person of color um, yeah. or someone, anybody who falls outside of what we consider the dominant, the dominant right. exactly. social structure. It, right. It's not just skin color, but that's that's a big one. Um, you it's always it's always part of who you how you face the world, right? Exactly, because it's in my face all the time. So I see it, yeah. I experience it. Yeah, yeah, and you're, you, you really raise, uh, I think, uh, we talked about this a little bit before we went, we went live, and, and that, that's the fact that in the military, the military is disproportionately represented by black men in particular, people of yes. color, but black men in particular. Um, why do you think that is? Part of the reason is people of color, black and brown people, they see that as an opportunity for their sons or their daughters to go to the military, to make something of themselves, if you will. But a larger reason, in my opinion, when wars are made, they're made by the power structures and the power structures that be in this country, they're white males and males of wealth and power and prominence. Most of their sons and daughters don't fight wars. So who does? The poor working class sons and daughters, they're the ones that fight the wars. And not just blacks, but poor whites as well. Their sons and daughters are the ones that go off to fight wars. And black and brown people are disproportionately put on the front lines. For example, in Vietnam, I had uh, buddies who were Marines. And when America first got engaged over there, black and brown troops were on the front lines. And initially, the Viet Cong was shooting over their heads because they asked the question, why is black man, what are you doing here? Why are you here? You know, we're, our war is not against you, but blacks were in the military. So they began to shoot to be a cop. And when they began to shoot them, they began to shoot the black soldiers. But initially they told the black soldiers, our war is not with you. Hmm. And, they were, and they were questioning, why are you here in Vietnam? And that's something I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with. But I'm just telling you what people I know that came back from there told me who were there. Mm -hmm. Some of the, the black soldiers and Marines that I knew personally. So what, what drew you to the military, James? Um, I wasn't drawn to the military. I was drafted okay. by the Army on June the 1st, 1970. Because at the time I was a student at Western Michigan University, but my student deferment ran out and I could not get it renewed because, and this, this was kind of my fault. My GPA had slipped down to 1.9 and you had to have a 2.0 in order for your deferment to uh, be intact. And mine had slipped to 1.9. And so therefore I was eligible for the draft and I got drafted. So I was determined I was not going to Vietnam because I didn't feel it was a just war. And I really didn't feel it was a just war for me as a black man. Mm -hmm. So I was supposed to report June 1st to the army. So I joined the Navy May 26th. I kind of circumvented the system a little bit because <laughs> the army came looking for me. <laughs> and my mother told him, so well, he's in Great Lakes, Illinois. And then uh, 
the Army representative said, well, he can't do that. She said, well, he did. That's where he is. He's in Great Lakes of the North. He's in the Navy. So to answer your question, I was not drawn to the military. The Navy was just, I felt, the lesser of the two evils, in my in my opinion. In my sure. opinion. Yeah. So, you know, in this book, again, it, you know, the title, Patriot to Traitor, it kind of gives away a little bit, at least the struggle. Mm -hmm. I don't, don't want to spoil the book for any of our readers, but... But, um, you know, it tracks uh, Terry Anderson's, uh, I guess it would be called a coming of age story, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, in he, more ways than just the military. Yeah, absolutely. And he comes from a family that traced its lino, uh, military lineage way back to the Civil War. I'm mm -hmm. um, not the Civil War. I'm sorry. The Revolutionary, Revolutionary War. War. Yeah. Um, and which, by the way, uh, African-Americans have represented the United States in all of its wars. Yes, they have. Um, and came from a family that was very patriotic, um, flag planted in the front yard, um, and yet you see this you see this tension develop and, and becoming stronger between um, Terry and his father, and uh, him wanting to be respectful of his father, um, but also feeling tension um, about and 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 really saying that her fa his father isn't seeing things as he's seeing them. Is that, uh, is that part of the coming of age or is that growing up in a different time with higher expectations? What, what's, what's behind that? Well, it's, it's more of a, a generational divide. Yeah. Whereas in his, Terry's father's generation, they felt the same things that Terry was feeling, but they were less willing to really do something about it or say something about it. They just kind of swallowed it down and just kept it moving. Whereas with Terry, he couldn't do that. He no longer could do that. He no longer could do that. Because Terry's father, he raised Terry to love America. And Terry did love America, just like his father did. He loved America, not because of what America was, but because of what America could be. And that's the thing that Terry's father always clung to, not because of how America was, because he didn't like it. Right. But he knew that the potential was there. If America lived up to her creed, it would be the greatest country on the earth. If she would just live up to her creed, that all men were created equal. Yeah. And that's what he hung his hat on. Yeah. And, you know, and that tension um, in, in the book, I mean, Terry loses his father. Um, he mm -hmm. loses uh, he loses uh, who is going to be the love of his life, it appears. Yeah. Um, and he, he and did his unborn child. Yeah. And his unborn child. Um, and so he had a succession of yeah, and he, he lost his friend to uh, yeah. a, a, a use of force uh, by mm -hmm. police officer. Mm -hmm. is that right. Did I get that? That's right? correct. That's yeah. correct. So there was a whole series of, of disillusioning. Um, yeah. not, not that he, because he was living with this at the beginning of the book, uh, but a whole series of really severe emotional setbacks. Yeah, and it wasn't just one thing, but it was the culmination of all these things. Right, right. And he had, and he had, um, he had. Uh, uh, I want to say colleagues. I don't know if that's the right word, um, uh, but people within his unit, um, even looking out for him. Mm -hmm. uh, worried that that this was going to get under his skin and eat at him and and, and cause uh, cause him problems. And I, I think a lot of what his father was doing was also trying to. I know you're mad. You have every right to be mad, but yeah, but but yeah, <laughs> but how how common was that in your experience in in the, in the military? You know that kind of that kind of relationship that recognizing the injustice, but also trying to, uh, um, you know, to keep, to keep people's, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, to, to keep them whole, I guess, to keep them from letting it damage them too much. That's a very uh, difficult thing because I myself, I ha I went through that and it's, it's a constant internal war within yourself. 
to keep your sanity yeah at that time because you 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 know what's going on in terms of the injustice but yet at the same time you understand you are just one person against a military machine just one person you and you can't do anything really about that other than have your own convictions about how you're going to be as a person and as a man how, if that makes any sense <laughs> it does make sense and so you know you mentioned staying sane um, and I don't know, I, I guess it kind of leads me to one of the questions that I wanted to talk about, and, and that might not have been your motivation, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, how, did you, how did you arrive at writing? How did you, because you've written, and we'll put these up in a minute so people can take a look at them, but you've published seven books, I think, and uh, in, in addition to the columns that you wrote, mm -hmm. uh, the hundreds, if not thousands of columns that you've yeah. written. How, how did you how did you come to that? Well, the uh, the impetus for my writing, the uh, encouragement is my wife. She's the one that encouraged me because I wrote a poem for her on our uh, I think it was our fifth our fifth wedding anniversary years ago, and we've we've been married like twenty twenty six years, twenty seven years this November. So I wrote her a poem, and she liked it. And then I wrote a few other poems and I had them just sitting around in a box laying around and she was looking at them and then she said, uh, why don't you put these in a book? And I never thought about a book or writing any book for that matter. And I thought, really? She said, yeah. I said, okay. So I did. And that was my first book. That was my first book as far as the book writing. And as far as writing columns, um, some years, a long time ago, 60 Minutes was here in Battle Creek, and they did a little in expose about the Kellogg Company. And they were showing uh, Kellogg employees. They were showing the city of Battle Creek. And the one thing I noticed that I did not see was there were no black people or any people of color. So if you were out of state and watching 60 Minutes, you think Battle Creek was just all white. You think the only people that work at Kellogg's are just all white. So I wrote a, uh, an opinion piece to the Battle Week Inquirer expressing that. And the uh, editor at the time, Steve Smith, said, uh, he said, uh, he said, I really like what you had to say. And we've kind of been looking for a voice of color on the paper. He said, you, you think you could do that? You know, and I said, oh, yeah, sure, I could do that. But see, really, I didn't know if I could. <laughs> But I felt I could, I felt I could, I could try it, and you know, just give it my best shot. So yeah. I wrote my first column in March of 2000, and Steve liked it, and I wrote for the Inquirer as the guest columnist for uh, 13 years ever since that point. And currently, I'm writing for the uh, Grand Rapids Times, and I've been writing for them for about six years. Yeah, yeah. So that's how my writing got started. And one thing that's kind of funny is when I was at Western, my college writing instructor told me, don't you ever try to write anything and sell it. I wish he were alive today so I could send him some things. <laughs> Showed him. Yeah. Uh, talk about uh, what, uh, you know, what you want uh, your audience, your reader um, to get. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you always write about the same things. Um, mm -hmm but you try to bring a perspective that, that, I mean, this is my judgment just from watching you over the years. You, and as you said, um, when you, that first column, it was about shining a light on a perspective that was missing. Um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what, what you hope to accomplish when you sit down to write a book or a column or a poem. When I write anything, especially a column, I'm not writing for the purpose of you, the reader, to agree with me. Now, if you do, that's fine. But if you don't, that's fine too. But the thing I want to do is to stimulate your thought process. I want you, after you read that column, to go, hmm, 
I never thought about that. That's what I want you to do. I just want you to think about it. Think about a view or a position that you hadn't before. Something that you hadn't considered. Just, just think about that. Just to cause you to think. Because once you start to think, you'll start to engage in dialogue with someone about that, whatever that topic may be. But that's that's my purpose when I write. It's just to just to make you think. What kind of reactions do you get? Um, I'd say 98% of them have been very, very positive. Yeah. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I wrote a column about um, a lot of our black youth, when they excel in the classroom, a lot of times they're ostracized by their peers because they say that they're trying to act white just because they get good grades in school. Now, to a lot of white people, they may not understand that as to why that is. And I ran into this lady in Myers one time and she recognized me from the paper. And she told me that her daughter cut that column out and put it on her refrigerator. So every morning when she went to school, she looks at it because that's what was happening to her. And she said that column gave her daughter some courage and encouragement to where she could withstand that, those, those jeers and, those, and the teasing from, from other students at her. And she thanked me for it. And she had tears in her eyes wow. because she was so grateful because she saw the effect it had on her daughter. Yeah. And so that's what you want as a writer to be able to touch people. Right. People you may never know. You don't know who you touch when you write. But when you do find out or, or someone brings it to your attention, it's it's a good feeling because that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. Do you have um, any anecdotes or examples of someone who came around or, or, or saw things differently because of, of, of some of what you've written or, or what you've written? I had a, uh, this wasn't something I had written, but I had spoken to this young man. He was a member of the NRA. He was a young, young, white, young white guy and he was in fatigues. I saw him at a uh, Juneteenth celebration at Claude Evans and he was in his fatigues, you know, you know, military down. And I had on a t-shirt said NRA, you know, not right America. And then on the back of it, it said buying Republicans one at a time. And so he was in, he was curious about it. He said, what's wrong with the NRA? He said, why are you, you know, why are you down in them? And I said, well, I said, uh, at one point in time, I said the NRA was a very useful organization because they promoted gun safety. That's what they used to do. I said, but around 1970, they turned into a political force and lobbyists. I said, and now, basically, they represent gun manufacturers, not so much gun owners. That's that's pretty much what they stand for now. And so we got on and on about the Second Amendment and this and that. And, and I told him uh, the, the Second Amendment really was an appeasement to slave owners. You know, he said, well, it gives me the right to bear arms. I said, yeah, it does. I said, but that was an afterthought, really, because the whole purpose of it was just to appease uh, Southern uh, senators or whatever, so they would ratify the uh, Constitution so that the young government, which was the United States, would have a standing army. Because one of the provisions was if you have a standing army, you no longer need an armed militia. So these militias were concerned about giving up their guns, especially the ones in the South, because they needed those guns in the South to keep the, the slave population under control. So they were worried about that. So the Southern states said, well, if we can't keep our guns, we're not going to ratify the Constitution that, that calls for a standing army because we're not giving up our guns. So they had a compromise, and the compromise was, well, we'll just put in a Second Amendment that will guarantee you the right to keep your guns. And the Southern state said, well, we want that in writing. So they put it in writing. And that's basically what the Second Amendment was for. 
Now, Sam, you, pay attention, please. The library will be closing in 30 minutes. <laughs> I guess that's a hazard of doing it in the building. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Please continue. <laughs> so, so as a result, the uh, Second Amendment, Amendment was put in the Constitution, giving the Southern states the right to keep their guns and the individual right to bear arms. That was just a side thought. That was an afterthought. That wasn't the main purpose, as a lot of people like to say. That that's what the Second Amendment was for. But it, it, it is in there for that purpose, but that was not its main purpose. Well, for most of the, you know, for most of the uh, Constitution's life, the Second Amendment and its application to individual rights was not quite so broad as it is today. That's only right. a few decades. Right. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it bears mentioning, James, you're, you're a, a native, I believe, of Battle Creek, a Battle Creek Central grad, right? Yes, graduated 1969. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, you've seen, you've seen a lot. That's, that's what we get to do as we get older. We get to say <laughs> we've seen a lot, right? I ain't get this for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm curious, uh, at least from your perspective on your hometown and the nation, um, not to limit it, but what changes have you seen and what hasn't changed in your in your perspective well battle creek um i would say um conditions between the races that they're, they're better than they were than when i was in high school that they're better and that's due mainly to the young people because the people my age uh, we haven't done a whole lot, I don't think, to to bring that about. It's, it's basically been the younger people, the younger generation, because they they're the ones who are who are paving the way for for us to be a better society. Because there's a lot of people my age, they're just they're they're, they're dug in on their old antiquated ideas about how things should be not willing to change, not wanting to change. And that's kind of the way that is. But it's the young people today, they they give me some hope. They give me some hope. Yeah. Well, I, you know, again, I, I just loved, you know, and we could talk a lot more about the book, but this is a half hour program, give or take. <laughs> But uh, the relationships that that is explored, and it's and you say you like you like to keep them uh, pretty, you know, concise. Yeah, uh, I do. But because uh, pe people's attention spans are short. Yeah, but the relationships I think are, are really uh, poignant, and and how uh, Terry navigates his life and and his touchstone with his relationships. Actually, one of the things I found really interesting that I, I made a note of in the. I have a lot of notes in the book, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the distance that he kept between himself and others, like his Sharon, I think her name was uh, the woman he was seeing, um, before he left. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. and, 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 then he, yeah. and he even makes a comment, um, later in the book about another woman that he met. He is a young man, but uh, after all, yes, he is. Yes, but, he is. uh, how he rec he recognized himself that he was quickly close to a total stranger, um, and I found that to be a pretty interesting dynamic about how you manage keep some people at arm's length, um, get close to others. So, it's a mm -hmm. really good book. I wanted I wanted to share um, with folks we we have the covers of of your other books, and let's see if I can uh, pull it up. Huh, I'm having trouble. Well, we might have to forego that. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> it's not going up. Sharing was canceled, my, my uh, interface says. So, um, yeah, this, uh, help, help me with the names of your book because I didn't bring the, the, uh, the cards with me. Stirrings from Your Soul. Stirrings from My Soul was your first book, right? Yes, that was my first book. Stirrings from My Soul, that's my first one. Uh, reflections that's my second as I see it that's my third now those three are all poetry yeah and my fourth book was sunk by the Navy which was a memoir of right. uh, the time I spent in the Navy during the uh, Vietnam era and uh, 
after uh, sunk by the Navy was, it's a thin line between a preacher and a pimp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to put those up because your your memoir, you have a photo of you as a, as a young man. Yeah, 1971. Yeah. You've got quite a figure there, James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I've been looking forward to this. And uh, um, if you can't find all folks, if you can't find all those books in the library, just tell us and we'll get them for you. But you can also buy them on Amazon. And it's one of the things I always talk about when I have a local author on, buy the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> buy the book. Oh, and the other books are um, uh, Cracks in the Mirror and uh, My View is Different. Right. And this one right here, Patriot. Yeah. To, to uh, trader. Yeah. Well, get the book and find out what it means uh, and what the title implies. You'll, you'll, I think you'll, you won't be disappointed. Thank you, James, for coming on. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we have a, a, another great guest next week, uh, Enrique um, Rodriguez, um, who, um, with his partner, owns uh, Thirty Two Social, which is a coffee shop downtown. Mm -hmm. And also they have recently created the uh, Better Together Kayaking, which does the free floats on the Battle Creek River. Um, and he's got a pretty interesting story, and I think you're all going to enjoy that as well. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and uh, we'll be back next week with another installment of Stories at Sundown. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.